I wanted to draw out what I thought were some of the key lessons um, that, that had an international relevance. Um, but I'm, and I'm particularly focusing on, and in a sense this is a bit of a footnote, perhaps uh, uh, to what Linda was talking about this morning, where she described what was very radical, fast, um, generally very positive change in England, um, which went under the title of In Control, which was the project that I ran from 2003 to 2009. Uh, I left in 2009 in something of a grump. <laughs> um, uh, I, did, I did leave of my own free will, but I'm sure it wouldn't have been very long um, before I'd have been pushed. Um, and although, I, I, in a sense, my talk is what went wrong, uh, I, still, I still don't feel like totally ashamed of everything that we did. Um, I think that in the context of the United Kingdom, um, the actually individualization, which seems like a, a modest thing, and everybody's going, well, individualizing the money is not the answer. I'm not quite sure who... Does anybody really believe that's the answer anyway? But it's quite important to do it, particularly when the government spends money on day centers in the UK. Just, he'll just develop a day center or develop group homes. So individualizing that money so that people can have control over it, boring as that may be, seems still to me a very fundamental essence of any kind of half hour system. Um, and I think that um, we, we did a pretty damn good job, and I think still by international standards, a pretty damn good job of achieving high level of flexibility for some folks. So uh, still when I go around the world and hear how individualized funding systems are working, I am a bit astonished by the, the bureaucracy that's loaded on people just for standard. You know, just like it's, it's just unquestionable that people would only be able to spend money on X or Y or Z. And, and we, I think, uh, although in a way the system has like that wave crashed down, still we did create a, stand, a new standard for what's possible. Just the other week, I ended up um, going on our Radio 4, which is our kind of uh, news program. And this is the very first time that the, the media had showed any interest in these issues at all. You know, you know, and this is, we've been doing this stuff for 15 years. And the very first time was when some bunch of doctors came out with a report that said, shock, horror, people are spending this money in unconventional ways. We must stop them. And so I ended up going on uh, the radio shows and saying, well, actually, why wouldn't people know better than doctors how they might spend some of this money? And, uh, it, it, you know, so, but we did, we have done some pretty kind of remarkable things, and that was good. But, um, and I think we did very well on control because before this, we, we were really struggling to let people, particularly people with intellectual disabilities, uh, have control, and we were terrible letting families, when obviously the family were the right people to be in control, having control, and we managed to make a lot of progress in a few years on that point, and, and a lot of that hasn't rolled back. And to a some degree, and this is where I always end up kind of having a strange fight with Canadians, I think, I, I, I haven't figured out, you all applauded, I haven't figured out the beauty of independent brokers. I just didn't make sense to me when we did it, and it still doesn't make sense to me. What I really like is the fact that we saw innovative community supports grow up in all sorts of different ways. Peer supports, forms of self-advocacy, different provisions, all sorts of interesting things. And I kind of think, and going back to what Michael said, it's quite good to know that we don't know, that it's pretty dangerous to assume we know how to organize this stuff. And however good the rationale sounds, um, it's probably a pretty good idea to just try stuff out. So I think, you know, we did, we, we did a lot that was interesting, but, but, this is, the already can't make out all the detail of this, the bottom line is that since 2010, uh, our government is uh, not only cutting the services, which are called social care for adults with disabilities, but cutting benefits, cutting housing rights, and in fact, people with disabilities are the number one target for government cuts in the United Kingdom, particularly severe in England. Um, and, and what amazes me is the whole individualized funding personalization roadshow continues as if this doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Like, as if it's, this is where it is really weird. Like, the whole economics of, of people's lives are being shattered by the most vicious right-wing government. You, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, people kill, keep turning up and doing the consultancy and saying, isn't it nice, and we'll make it a bit better. And I, and I think there's something profoundly wrong in our system and very worrying. 
because it's, it's like we can disconnect our brain and our heart in some way. Um, and I suppose the big learning for me, and this, is a, and this is a regret and a self-criticism, I think, although, you know, through that period when I was leading this process, I, 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 did do, I didn't do nothing about trying to build a movement or connect people with learning difficulties with people with physical disabilities. I tried bloody damn hard, actually, but nobody really wanted to do it, and that was the striking thing. Nobody really wanted a unified movement, and what you ended up doing was taking your good ideas to the only show in town, which was government, and on bended knee, you offer them your good ideas, and, um, and you watch while, well, I actually might, I don't know why I feel more uncomfortable saying this in such a large room. What I said in my workshop today is you give them your good ideas and watch them fuck it up, and... <laughs> And, and I think that the lesson for me is that you cannot, in a sense, get a system to treat people as citizens. You have to start behaving as citizens and to demand better systems as such. And, and that's a profound question, and individualized funding is, is just one aspect of that, I think. I think it raises big questions about our relationship with the state and the welfare state as a whole. Um, and I think in our role, what we must do, and again, this goes back to what Michael's saying, the way I put Michael's point is like, we're people who just stopped digging a pit. I put it a slightly more pessimistic way than Michael. I think that we spent so long doing the wrong thing that we've got to keep reminding ourselves that we know next to nothing about what the right thing would look like. Um, that's not a reason not to act, but it is to act with humility, um, to understand that we don't know most of the time, um, and that we're going to have to figure out how to do things different. And doing things different is called innovation. And I do think the concept of innovation is really important to hang on to um, in the way we think. I think we do need to stop thinking about the perfect system, and we do need to think about how do we grow the capacity to innovate at every level, at the level of the citizen, at the level of the community, at the level of services, at the level of government. Um, and these are just three, and I'm just going to tell three little stories about. So this, I don't know whether this makes a very good final slide, but this is my final slide. And these are kind of slightly techy points, but um, I think one of the things that really strikes me about the learning from, from what we did in England is that the government really struggles with the notion that good change takes time because it's human like when we talk about culture change and these kind of words, I mean, what do we mean? We mean human beings figuring out things in different ways and looking at things in different ways. These are not things you can do by legislation. These are not things you can do by instruction because they're human. Um, what government tends to do when it's in a hurry to innovate is to cheat. So just one example of that is we created this notion of people having an individual budget, but we also enabled local authorities uh, the equivalence of kind of mini provinces, if you like, in a Canadian context, to be able to give people a budget, but then carry on delivering home care services with that budget in a way that didn't change at all. You see what I mean? So what they did was all those, suddenly, they were all able to tick a box that says we've met that target, but no real innovation has happened. I think the other thing that was really striking, for between 2003 and 2007, basically all the innovation all of the positive change happened with next to no money at all. Everything that we created, we gave away for free. And we did brilliant, brilliant stuff, sorry. But it was, it was really good, and it really made a big difference. And then in 2008, the government spent, over three years, not all at once, half a billion pounds. So, you know, double it, billion, uh, you know, it's a lot of money on implementing self-directed support. Pretty much every penny of that was wasted. In fact, I think it did more harm than good. What it did was it suddenly invited the likes of PricewaterhouseCooper and a whole range of consultancy agencies to come in, steal our ideas, and sell them back to local government. And you just watch that money disappear out of the system. And that's not so bad, but it also then erodes, and it leads to what Tim's talking about, this loss of institutional memory. It actually, it's worse than that. It, it undermines the people doing the real innovation. And, and suddenly, this thing's become really sexy, and all the people in power want control over it and want the money to control it. And actually, the real innovation's all gone down the plug hole. And, and the third thing, and this is something I do feel particularly um, bad about, is it's it's quite easy to be too clever by half, and some of the things I think I feel most regret for 
Um, well, when you start solving things, which in retrospect you realize we're solving the wrong problem, you're solving the problem the system gives you. And the example I would give um, of this um, that still really bothers me is, is we, we figured out a really nice way of just letting people know their budget. For me, that's, it's good to know your budget, and it's good to know your budget as early as possible, because um, then it puts you more in control. That's my view. Uh, not everybody agrees with that. Um, but we worked out how to do that in a fairly straightforward way. And then uh, managers would say to us, yeah, but our social workers, we can't trust them to do this right. They'll, you know, while you're worrying about social workers saving money, <laughs> the managers in the system are worrying about social workers spending too much money, <laughs> okay? So they then demanded that we create more complex systems. We called it the RAS, the resource allocation system. And, and we then use these systems, and we kind of start, and in a sense, what we were doing is responding to a, a manager's anxiety about their inability to work in trust with their colleagues. That's the wrong problem. Don't solve that problem, is what I learned. But in a way, it was like too easy to be, able, oh, right, yeah, we can do that. And we were thinking what we were achieving is we'd get more people to get more individual budgets. And I suppose that's my lesson, is you, you really do need to try and, and I regret having done that, and I think it was a loss of integrity for me. I think you have, to, you have to bring these issues home and think about what am I doing and why am I doing it? Is this really a problem that deserves a decent answer? And if it is, go and find it. But if it isn't, just don't do it. That's me.